So at this point, I'd like to take some questions from the audience. Uh, if you could please direct your questions either to the panel or to any individual panelist. And please, um, if you could wait for the microphone so that we can hear your question. So, yes. Thank you. Uh, Malcolm Telfer, Stephen Davies. Uh, by the way, three really fascinating papers. But um, Stephen, my question is for you. I was really fascinated by your use of the Google Ngram. I was just wondering if you plugged in the word, in the word cruise or, or the words cruise ships, uh, whether you would have seen a significant increase, at least since the 1960s. And um, also, would you, you didn't really comment on this aspect, There's an enormous growth in cruise shipping uh, that has led to actually increased visits uh, you know, to many ports from, from ships. Um, is that likely to have an impact, do you think, on maritime culture and the interest in maritime traditions, or is it just a, an item of uh, typical conspicuous consumption in, a, in the 21st century? Crumbs. Um, no, I haven't put in cruise and cruise ship. Uh, I would suspect that it'll be fairly low frequency. It'll be a bit like mar maritime culture. It will be a low frequency item and it will spike towards 2000. But we're still, I mean, most of those words, uh, I, I did put in a control. I tried football. And football is a very interesting one because it is something like, 700 times more frequent than any maritime word uh, in, in, in popular use. I don't think uh, cruise ships are going to be up there. Uh, cruise ships, anyway, tend to be locked to highly selective places. Uh, they don't, apart from the, the, the luxus cruise ships, which are like Lindblad and other the, of the small cruise ships that go to particular places for uh, basically high ticket clientele. Most of the mass cruise ships go on very set itineraries to places that have very set things to do, which is commoditized culture, is, is what they're really about. And indeed, one of the bitches about having cruise ships in port, particularly in, in the Caribbean, for example, is that most people never leave the cruise ship. And if they do leave the cruise ship, they never leave the cruise terminal, where they just totter out and find the stores that they could find everywhere to buy the things that they can buy everywhere. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Stephen. Um, a question to you. Uh, Mr. Quack, I'm from a shipping company, XC Ferrer as well. Uh, I like the way you analyze that the GDP or the Hong Kong 2% is very explicit figure to use, which is contributed by the shipping or marine industry. But it's interesting to note that you say it's 20%, which related, which I think so too. Uh, my question to you is, uh, what is the best way to going forward to convince people that this supply chain or logistic is all part of the marine related economy? I don't think there's an answer. I mean, one of the reasons I pulled up that UN statistics on, on work activities is that until governments start gathering data in ways that, ways that bring out the maritime element, for example, of logistics, maritime just gets more and more buried, uh, particularly as the maritime sector becomes more technically sophisticated. So it's using more and more common platform stuff with other parts of the economy its maritime element simply gets made invisible. And there's no way of collecting the data that makes it visible. I mean, I've been banging the ear of, of people in Hong Kong about this for about six or seven years and getting absolutely nowhere because their obligations internationally are to gather statistics in a way that make statistics internationally cross comparable. So we either all do it uh, or none of us do it. There's no way that there's a, a one country can break the mold. I have a question, but nevertheless, I'll give a chance to others. If not a question, I would, I would like to ask another question. 
Do we have any other questions from the audience? Any other questions? Would you like to ask? Since this is a maritime heritage, I would like to ask the same presenter. I know you're very, very rich, and the Hong Kong Museum is basically your brainchild. And the uh, question to you is, uh, What's the best way moving forward to make Singapore is something similar to the Hong Kong Maritime Museum? And uh, if you're given a chance, what's the best way if the Minister of Transport in front of you, how do you like to present this idea to him? I don't think there's an answer. Uh, I partly, I busk it. When Go Chok Tong did come to the Hong Kong Maritime Museum, I busked it. I just tried to make, make it interesting for him and to give him some fun and make him see that this stuff was interesting. But that was the best I could do. I mean, he, he, he's a guy with track record in the shipping industry. Uh, and push comes to shove, he was not really that interested uh, in the stuff. And most people aren't. Even within maritime museums, I've discovered, Probably the majority of maritime museum employees don't, and this is even on the curatorial side these days, don't understand the stuff that they're dealing with. Uh, they have some kind of shallow idea, and they can tell probably a sextant from an octant, but I wouldn't bet on it. Uh, and they would know roughly where it would go in an exhibition storyline. But if you ask them to explain uh, the spherical triangle, and how you use a sextant to uh, solve the triangle and find a position, their eyeballs would contra-rotate and they wouldn't know. So much of this stuff is there, if you like, in the way that it also appears in themed restaurants, increasingly. And part of the problem there is that if you talk to the people, they're under extreme pressure to make their museums work in business terms, which means getting people through the door, and they are being judged on metrics, which, for example, I was told, involve the number of people under the age of 12 and from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds. And if you're not pulling those people, you're gonna get judged very severely, and your storylines have got to be at least appealing to the brighter amongst those. I mean, you know perfectly well before you start that 80% of them are pressed men. And if you gave them a choice at the door, okay, lads, it's McDonald's or an hour in the museum, over to you, we'll meet out here in an hour's time, you'll probably have two students with you as you wander through, if you're lucky. So how you persuade anybody this is the way I did try with one person who asked the hard question. A man called Cici Liu, who owns, he's a, an ex-merchant skipper uh, from the mainland, who owns a shipping company called Paraku. And he's well known throughout the industry for being a true lover of fine wine. He has a wonderful cellar of always at least 500 bottles of the very best vintages. And dinner with Cici is a delight. And he was banging my ear about how, as a director of a maritime museum, I was simply wasting money. Uh, I was not making a profit. I kept asking him for money, coming around and fundraising, and why was I wasting his time? And the only way I could think of answering was by saying, well, look, Cece, you think you're a, a, a gentleman and a civilized man, and one of the symptoms of this is that you have a very fine wine cellar, which has cost you a very great deal of money. Well, you could put it this way. You could say that your wine cellar is a complete waste of money, but it's an important symbol of your civility. Well, in societies, we have things called museums, which are a complete waste of money, but they're an important symbol of our civility. I'm not sure I convinced him. <laughs> um, well, with that, if uh, there aren't any other questions, we can break for some coffee, and then we'll reconvene here with around 3.15, I think, so we have a few minutes to go and, um, and have coffee. So let's please uh, uh, thank our speakers.